Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, in a short while, we will have as guests Caitlin Williscroft, a specialist who works for UN Women on the Women, Peace and Security Program in the Afghanistan Country Office. She will be joined by Nahid Farid, a former Afghan parliamentarian, as well as Mariam Safi, Executive Director of the Organization for Policy Research and Development Studies. Uh, they will join us virtually to brief in the context of the anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 and the open debate tomorrow on women, peace, and security. The UN Environment Program today released its production gap report, which found that despite increased climate ambitions and net zero commitments, governments still plan to produce more than double the amount of fossil fuels in, tw in 2030 than what would be consistent with glo limited glo limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Over the next two decades, governments are collectively projecting an increase in global oil and gas project production and only a modest decrease in coal production. The report also shows that countries have directed over $300 billion in new funds towards fossil fuel activities since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, more than they have towards clean energy. The Secretary General said that the report shows that there is still a long way to go to a clean energy future. He added that it is urgent that all remaining public financiers, as well as private finance, including commercial banks and asset managers, switch their funding from coal to renewables to promote full decarbonization of the power sector and access to renewable energy for all. You can find the full report online. At a Security Council meeting on the situation in the Great Lakes region, the Secretary General Special Envoy, Wang Xia, said that the region is at a crossroads. He reiterated that the main threat to peace and stability remains the persistence of armed groups. But Mr. Shah added bilateral and regional initiatives attest to the awareness of the added value of dialogue and cooperation. More than ever, he said, it is necessary to consolidate these gains. Turning to COVID-19, he said the pandemic has exacerbated vulnerabilities, but also demonstrated the resilience of societies in the region. He reiterated the Secretary General's call for greater solidarity to facilitate access to vaccines and to strengthen existing health systems and structures. Martha Amaakia Bobe, the Assistant Secretary General for Africa in the Departments of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Peace Operations, also spoke to council members. This afternoon, the Security Council will have a meeting on Somalia, followed by consultations on Lebanon. And speaking of Somalia, our humanitarian colleagues say that climate shocks are worsening the situation in the country, which is bracing for a third consecutive below average rainy season. As a result, the November cereal harvest in the northwest of Somalia is projected to be 63% below the average levels in the past decade. More than 250,000 people are facing severe water shortages, half of them in Jubaland state. There's also a reduction in pasture for livestock, affecting vulnerable people's food security and nutrition. Without humanitarian assistance, nearly 3.5 million people across Somalia will face crisis or worse levels of food insecurity by the end of the year. Some 1.2 million children under the age of five are also likely to be acutely malnourished. Of these, more than 213,000 are projected to be severely malnourished. Water, food, and health assistance are the most urgent humanitarian needs, according to our partners on the ground. Humanitarian organizations are trucking water, providing cash vouchers, and delivering nutrition supplies to people in need. They are, however, significantly constrained by the lowest levels of funding in five years. Somalia's 2021 humanitarian response plan is only 50% funded. On Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues are alarmed by the escalating conflict in the north, especially following reports of the impact on civilians, including after an airstrike in Mekele, in Tigray, today. Initial information from the ground indicates that civilians, including women and children, were injured. We're trying to gather more information. More than 5.2 million people across Tigray, that's more than 90% of the region's population, need life-saving assistance, including nearly 400,000 people facing famine-like conditions. We repeat our call to all parties to the conflict to de-escalate across Tigray, Amhara, and Afar to avoid further casualties and the suffering of civilians. Humanitarian needs are also increasing in Amhara and Afar due to the spillover into these regions of the conflict in Tigray. All parties to the conflict must always uphold international humanitarian law and ensure the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure. 
Just an update on UN operations. Some 30% of all our staff in Ethiopia are in different regions of the country, including Tigray. The UN and humanitarian partners are staying and delivering. For safety measures, a small proportion of the UN team has been relocated, and that's around 100 UN staff and 17 dependents. We currently have nearly 400 staff in Tigray alone, committed to delivering life-saving needs to the most vulnerable people. Including national and, in and international NGOs, that number is nearly 2,000 people in the region. Across the country, our team on the ground notes multiple safety issues that are sparking an increasing number of internally displaced people who urgently need humanitarian assistance. Turning to Syria, we're deeply concerned about ongoing and increasing hostilities in recent months in the Northwest and the impact that this is having on civilians. Yesterday, artillery shelling was reported in Idlib. One civilian was killed and four others injured. Artillery shelling was also reported in other parts of Idlib and in western Aleppo. Today, several civil civilian casualties have been reported following artillery shelling in Ariha town, south of the city of Idlib. The recent escalation is the most significant increase in hostilities in northwest Syria since the ceasefire agreement of March 2020. The UN condemns all violence in Syria. We remind all parties to the conflict to respect international humanitarian law, including the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks and the obligation to take all feasible precautions to avoid and minimize harm to civilians and civilian infrastructure. And I have a COVID-19 update for you today from Cabo Verde with the UN team led by resident coordinator Ana Grasa, continues to help authorities to address the health and socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. As of today, nearly 80% of people over the age of 18 have received at least the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and nearly half of them have been fully vaccinated. UN agencies have provided strategic support for the national vaccination campaign. Cabo Verde has received more than 700,000 vaccine doses, both through COVAX and bilaterally, and this is enough to vaccinate nearly all eligible people. The UN team is also supporting health facilities, helping students with distance learning, and providing meals for children, among other assistance. The Food and Agriculture Organization today launched the Global Map of Salt-Affected Soils, a key tool for halting salinization and boosting productivity. FAO said that the map, a joint project involving 118 countries and hundreds of data crunchers, will allow experts to identify where sustainable soil management practices should be adopted to prevent salinization and sodification and to manage salt-affected soils sustainably. FAO noted that the map can inform policymakers when dealing with climate change adaptation and irrigation projects. As for press encounters, beyond our guests and also Monica Grayley, who will uh, be speaking to you at, after I'm done, uh, Ambassador Rachel Awor Omamu, the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kenya, will brief reporters at the Security Council stakeout following the Council's meeting on the situation in the Great Lakes region. Then this afternoon at around 4 p.m., Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, representative of the United States of America, will brief reporters on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, also at the Security Council. And finally, tomorrow our guest will be Christine Shana Bergener, the Secretary General's Special Envoy on Myanmar, and she will be here in this room to brief you on the situation in Myanmar. Yes, turning to questions, Michelle. Thanks, Farhan. Um, just wanted to follow up on what you were saying on Ethiopia. Um, just to clarify, you're, you were talking about the airstrike today um, and that the initial information from UN people on the ground. Can you just clarify what and how many people you think might be injured? Uh, well, like I said, we, we don't have, at this point, we don't have um, the, the casualty figures, but the initial information indicates that some civilians, including women and children, were injured. We don't have numbers, but we're trying to get more information on that. And what's, what's the Secretary General's um, reaction to this? Has he spoken with the Prime Minister? Well, he's made clear his concerns, uh, in, including in recent days, uh, and, those, and those concerns continue. He hasn't spoken... Uh, to him, uh, to the Prime Minister today, but we have made clear what our concerns are about the impact of these operations on civilians and the need to avoid uh, any uh, offensive ac uh, uh, activities that, uh, that can target civilians or civilian infrastructure. Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, 
Two questions. First, does the Secretary General have any comment on the uh, bombings in Syria today? Yes. Um, what I can say about that is, of course, first of all, we've been deeply concerned about the uh, ongoing and increasing hostilities uh, throughout the country and and, uh, and the impact that that's been having on, on civilians. I just mentioned uh, our concerns about the artillery shelling that happened uh, in uh, uh, south of the city of Idlib. But separately, we are also following with concern reports of a military bus coming under attack in Damascus earlier this morning in an attack that kills scores of people. Uh, the UN strongly condemns all violence in Syria, and as always, we urge all parties and those with influence over them to ensure the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure at all times, and that includes schools, markets, and health facilities. My Thank you. My second question is about talks uh, being hosted by Russia between representatives of the Taliban and neighboring countries today. Um, is the UN involved in any way in um, observing, monitoring those talks? We've not been involved in this in this latest round of talks, but we'll uh, but we'll be in touch with uh, the various. Uh, partners who have been uh, working uh, to get uh, uh, the, the talks going and see what information we can get. But at this stage, uh, what we're encouraging is is to see whether uh, there can be uh, more of an effort by countries, both in the region and uh, and more generally throughout, uh, to uh, to work uh, to ensure that uh, that. Uh, the situation in Afghanistan remains peaceful and, and the basic rights of all Afghans are upheld. Yes. Yes, Farhan. Uh, just back to Ethiopia. You are uh, using the word airstrike today rather than reported airstrike. Um, so that, I su suspect, with today's event, you confirming it's an airstrike. Can you also confirm that the two previous airstrikes, this reported airstrikes from the... U the, the UN believes that the damage there is consistent with an airstrike. And given these three airstrikes in the last few days uh, on Mekele, um, in terms of what is being hit by these airstrikes, do you in any way see that these could be deemed legitimate military targets? Uh, it's, it's not for me to determine whether something is a legitimate military target. We, from our standpoint, have raised concerns about any attacks that disproportionately harm civilians. Uh, and, uh, and beyond that, of course, we would need to, to gain further information about why the, the targets were chosen the, the way they were. I, I believe in the, in the earlier cases, uh, there, there have even been uh, a, a, an admission from, uh, from the relevant authorities that, that they were airstrikes. So I have nothing further to say on, on it than that. Uh, and just going back to, it's now nearly two weeks since the Secretary General was in the Security Council um, on this issue. And pushed very hard the Ethiopian permanent representative. Have you had any further contact from the Ethiopians to justify the expulsion of the UN officials? We, we have no formal communication of that, that, would, that would provide uh, the sort of reasoning. That the, in other words, the information that the Secretary General has asked for, we have not received, no. Uh, yes, uh, 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 Alan and then Carla. Alan first. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, Regarding the the, uh, the question of the meeting uh, on Afghanistan in Moscow, the so-called Moscow format, uh, the participants call, called uh, for um, donor co conducting convening a donor conference uh, by the UN to help the Afghanistan uh, to recover from this crisis. Any comments on this proposal of the participants of the Moscow format meeting? Thank you. Well, certainly the United Nations is always willing to, to do what it can to raise funds uh, for the support of the people of Afghanistan. I don't have any announcement uh, to make at this point about a donor conference, but, uh, but we're aware of uh, the, the calls and we'll see what, uh, what can be arranged. Yes, in the back. Thank you, Vahan. You mentioned that the U.S. ambassador will be briefing on the DPRK at the Security Council, or did you mean it, uh, at the Security Council stakeout, or would it be in this room? Uh, at the, I said uh, at the Security Council stakeout, so that's where she'll be. 